So here's what we've learned in the last 25 years uh, in my laboratory. A lesion occurs in the spinal cord, the blood-brain barrier opens and there's bleeding. And you get these little green Pac-Men macrophages come in very rapidly and they drive the axons backwards. It's called dieback phenomena. So those are the Pac-Men. As that's occurring, the astrocytes in the area of inflammation move away and surround the entire area of inflammation and make a scar. That's what we call the scar. And that's very important because they wall off the area of inflammation so it doesn't spread. So that's, that's the job of the scar. It's really important. The axons are driven backwards, and they actually associate with these little pink cells. They are stem cells. They're oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. But inside the core of the lesion, they don't make myelin. They just stay in a relatively undifferentiated state. And the axons sit on them and make a little synapse, and they stay there for the rest of your life. And the, the question is, how, how do you get axons that are now in this dystrophic, locked-in state to regenerate? Okay, and, and we've decided uh, to basically build a bridge through this or bypass the whole damn thing. All right, now, what's our strategy and how, how to do that? This is Mike Steinmetz. He's a neurosurgeon at, at uh, the Cleveland Clinic now. He worked in my lab doing his, his, re his, his residency research. And I, I asked Mike to find a way to get axons to cross our little spot assay that I talked about yesterday because it's a very difficult barrier to overcome. And there are two things you have to do to get axons to cross. This little gap. You have to drive the intrinsic growth response of the axon. It's called the conditioning response. You have to, you have to give them high test fuel. And we do that by causing an inflammatory response actually in the sensory ganglia. But there are other ways to do that which I'll talk about. And you've got to get rid of the inhibitory molecules. And one way to do that is with chondroitinase. And when you combine intrinsic growth support and extrinsic modulation of the environment, the numbers of axons that cross are really high, and you get a synergy. So they, they cross in large numbers. So you have to do both of those things. High test fuel and get rid of the guardrails. Now, how do we change this into a clinical setting? How do you take advantage of this knowledge? So let's go back to Ramoni Cajal in the 1800s and his student Tello, who inserted peripheral nerves into the cortex of a rabbit. Uh, Cajal was testing his neurotrophic hypothesis by doing this. And these peripheral nerves can regenerate. That was known a long time ago. They're filled with great cells called Schwann cells. And they showed back in the 1800s that nerve cells in the cortex, that central nervous system, would send their axons out of the nervous system and regenerate into this graft. Now, back when Cajal reported this, people didn't believe him. And they said, no, no, these aren't, these aren't axons coming from the cortex. They're coming from this direction, from the meninges, and going in that direction. They, didn't, they did not believe it. How can you not believe Cajal? But they didn't. Now, 80 years passed. And then this classic paper from Albert Aguayo and Sam David was published in Science, where they repeated Tello, but with a new labeling technique that could give directionality, so we'd know where the nerves came from. And they took a peripheral nerve, and they bridged from the brain stem of the spinal cord of a rat, all the way down to the caudal end of the spinal cord, multiple centimeters of distance. And with this new tracing technique, called horseradish peroxidase, they could put a dye in the graft itself, and that would be taken up by the nerve fibers in the, in the peripheral nerve graft. And you could see clearly that there were cells in the central nervous system sending their axons into the graft. Cajal was right, and Aguayo and Sam proved it. The problem was in 1981 that once the axons got to the end of the bridge, and there are many thousands of axons that can regenerate, they couldn't get out. And you can see that here. The white staining are the axons in the bridge. And you can see that this is, the, this is where the bridge is inserted, and nothing, almost nothing comes out. And the question is, why not? Why don't the axons come out? Many years pass, another 25 years go by, and we discovered that there's a little scar around each inserted graft filled with proteoglycans. And we wondered if the proteoglycans around the, these little uh, bridges were creating a kind of a cul-de-sac 
effect, so they couldn't come out. So we combined chondroitinase with the classic bridging technique that goes back over 100 years here. And you can see there's a spinal cord lesion here, and there's the bridge. The bridge is an autograft. It comes from the same animal. And the idea is to try to get axons from above to bypass the lesion and then reinnervate something. And we had remarkably good success. And that's been published. We had good success in 2006 using a C3 hemisection lesion to restore four paw function so the animals could extend the wrist and walk. And just last year, we had really nice success in restoring diaphragm function almost back to normal using a C2 hemisection model. That was published in Nature. And that's how I got to meet people at Work to Walk and Unite to Fight Paralysis because they heard about that paper and kind of got turned on and invited me. And now I'm here to tell you that we've gone further. So, so what have we done to go further? These are just hemisection lesions. And that's not what's really going on. Uh, lesions are much bigger. People are Asia A. It means almost complete transection, or at least functionally transected. And we, we, we want to try to bridge a complete transection injury, the most difficult of all animal models, animal models to get to regenerate. So that's our model. And what do we try to re restore? So I want to point out two people. The first is Yu Shang Li. And I'll tell you more about him shortly, but Yu Shang is fantastic. All of this work, everything I'm going to tell you is because of his genius and his surgical expertise. And this student, Mark DePaul, works is my student and works with the two of us. So this is Yu Shang Li. And um, he's a bladder expert. And I'll tell you why he's a bladder expert in a second. And we thought that rather than tackling the most difficult task of walking, maybe we could tackle two muscles this time, not just the diaphragm, which is one muscle, or the extensors, which is what, maybe we could tackle two muscles, the bladder, which is the detrusor muscle that squeezes, and the sphincter, which controls bladder. Two muscles, very basic function, very important for spinal cord injury. And of course, you all know about the problems with bladder function. There's a disconnection between the detrusor and the sphincter. Normally, of course, when the detrusor squeezes after the bladder is full, the sphincter needs to relax so urine can come out. But in spinal cord injury, the descending information that coordinates detrusor and sphincter is missing. And so now bladder squeezes, but the sphincter stays closed. So you must catheterize. And catheterization itself can lead to all kinds of problems, all the way as traumatic as kidney failure and death. And so we, we are asking, in a complete transaction model, can we restore urination? And I'll tell you why you, we picked urination for another reason, and it's more interesting and kind of humorous. There's a very important paper that was published in 2000, 1996 by Heinrich Chang and Lars Olson. And they, in a complete transection model, had bridged the spinal cord and were claiming that animals could walk. And what they had done is use a peripheral nerve autograft. Here's the, here's the graft area here. Here's the spinal cord rostral. Here's the spinal cord caudal. There's the big gap that's created in the spinal cord. And they claimed with grafting and a trophic factor called FGF, which I'll tell, tell you what it does shortly. Um, they claimed that the animals could have some walking ability, 1996. That paper was highly controversial, was difficult to reproduce by a number of labs in the United States. The word got out that this is not true. And um, scorn was cast upon the, the, the field uh, of peripheral nerve grafting. And there was nothing done. It wasn't funded at the NIH. This is a very difficult surgical technique. But once you learn it, you know how. And I'll tell you more about it shortly. But nonetheless, if you can see the red axons that are labeled in the graft, this is six months after injury. You can see the red fibers. They come from above. And I don't know if you can see clearly, but some of them can actually cross and enter the spinal cord on this side. So they bridge the gap, regenerated. And I asked Yu Shang when he came, because he worked with Heinrich Chang, and he came to Cleveland, do these animals walk? And he admitted to me, no. 
but they sure can pee. I said, really? That's very interesting and very important. Let's study that. And so we, we did. So he, here's the model that we, we use, the rat spinal cord. We cut a five millimeter gap around T8, 9 area. So that's a complete transection and a gap is created. You can see the little cartoon over here on the surgical technique. Then what we do is to take intercostal nerves from the rat. It's an autograft, and we soak those in chondroitinase. That gets rid of inhibitory molecules in the graft and provides some chondroitinase to the spinal cord. Next, what we do is to inject chondroitinase on either side okay, of the bridge. And then after that, we put in fibrin. You heard about fibrin yesterday. I'm going to try salmon fibrin. Here, and FGF is in the fibrin. The FGF is very important, we now know, for establishing a proper interface between the Schwann cells in the graft and the astrocytes in the cord. You can see a control. This is what the astrocytes normally do. They make a wall. But in the presence of the FGF and or chondroitinase, the astrocytes are more aligned. And you can see in tissue culture, it's hard to see, I know, flat astrocytes in the absence of FGF, bipolar-oriented astrocytes in a dish. So they just elongate like this. The FGF also does that to axons. It helps them elongate like this to go that way rather than branch. So FGF is really, really helpful. And so that was our acute model. Okay, so autograft, there are about 18 little pieces that go in here, right? Chondroitinase, FGF, and then what we can do is to label the nerve fibers. We can put a dye here and look for axons that have gone this direction. And we can put a dye here called retrograde to look for the neurons in the brainstem up here that control bladder function. They're right here in this brainstem area. It's called the pond. And so neurons here control urination. They get input from the cortex, but there they are. They're, in order to urinate, of course, there's a CPG for urination. It's way down in the lower part of the spinal cord. And we had no idea if we could bridge the lesion here, would the axons go that far, or do they have to? All right? We just didn't know. So here's what we've found. It's actually rather remarkable. And I'll show you a movie in a second. Um, and could you do me a favor and turn off the sound? Because I've got Star Wars. It's, it's a little bit too crazy. But <laughs> you want to hear Star Wars music when I play the music? All right. That, was that a phone? That's not my computer. <laughs> so, so take a look. So, he, here's the, so here's the spinal cord. This is, again, six months after injury. It takes a long time. Here's the rostral spinal cord. There's the caudal spinal cord. All right, there's the interface. There's the graft. It's not stained. And we, we look for axons that are called proprio-spinal. They're in, very important for balance and crude motor behaviors. And you can see here at different places in the graft, OK, as you go farther away, here's a scale bar. This is about five millimeters. And you can see these red fibers here here and here. So they, they regenerate and they keep going in the presence of chondroitinase. They just don't stop. All right, and here's the interface here. You can see these axons. I hope you can see there's red fibers coming in. A little bit dark in this room, but see these fibers? They've regenerated and they've come out. All right, and here's a quantification and they keep going. They can go multiple millimeters past now that chondroitinase is added. Here's the movie. So we've labeled these fibers with BDA. Here's their, their exiting. There are hundreds and hundreds of fibers. These are proprio-spinal neurons sending their axons. Here they're entering. Here they are. Here is an adjacent section. You can see them coming in. Here they are. You see them? And here's the surprising point. Without doing anything, they just keep going. Here they are here. That's about two millimeters. Here they are here, about five millimeters. We didn't knock out P10 in these animals. These are proprio-spinal neurons. There's lots of them. 
Here they are at about seven millimeters, and they're still going. It's really surprising. So these neurons themselves, without doing anything, just getting them across the bridge, have a potential to regenerate, at least at acute stages. We've looked at these fibers. They make tyrosine hydroxylase. This is a, a, a metabolite towards the synthesis of noradrenaline, very important transmitter, in particular for bladder function and also for other kinds of behaviors. Again, here's the interface between the graft and the host. In the presence of this cocktail, graft, FGF, and chondroitinase, you can see lots of fibers, hundreds of them, entering the distal spinal cord. Serotonergic fibers. Serotonin is another important transmitter you've heard about already. Very important for maintaining the, 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 the tone of the spinal cord and very important for urination. And you can see they regenerate and they keep going past the graft for long distances. And this panel on the bottom shows that these fibers make synapses in the caudal spinal cord. So six months, the fibers can regenerate and keep going. How far can these fibers go? Surprisingly, they can go all the way to the end of the spinal cord, all the way to the lumbosacral levels. And you can see with this stain, these are serotonergic nerve terminals in the lumbosacral spinal cord. And these are tyrosine hydroxylase terminals in the lumbosacral spinal cord. Both of those transmitter systems and in addition to the proprio-spinal system, can go very, very long distances, and that's quantified here. With just FGF alone and the bridge, some can regenerate, but not very far. With just chondroitinase and the bridge, some can regenerate, but not very far. But with the triple combination, they go the farthest. So we have regeneration, and it's very long distances by just simply building the bridge and getting axons across. So some neurons can grow. What neurons are these? Who, who can grow this well in the adult spinal cord? Having been told just the other day that that can't happen, well, it does. So who, who are the special guys? So we put a label here to look at who these neurons are that are sending axons across. Some come from the spinal cord. They're called proprio-spinal. But for urination, you really want the pontine micturition center, called Barrington's nucleus, that, tells, that controls your bladder and your sphincter, and the so-called D region, right up here. And when we put a label way down here, and you look for neurons in Barrington's nucleus and the D region, there they are. You can see them. They have sent axons from there all the way down to there. All right? It takes six months, but they can do it. We looked at this nucleus here. That's the RAFA. Look at all those labeled neurons, all right? They make serotonin. And there's this nucleus right next to it. It's called nucleus gigantocellularis reticularis. Very important for crude locomotor behavior. So there's a gigantocellularis, lots of neurons. Noradrenaline, the locus ceruleus, neurons there. I don't know if you can see the table. These are all the controls with zeros. But when you look at the triple combination, there are hundreds and hundreds of neurons in the brain stem that can send axons across the bridge all the way down to the lumbosacral spinal cord. It takes a long time to get there, six months we had to wait. All right, but they go, and they keep going, and they don't stop. We didn't knock out P10. Now, talking to Zhigang huh, about this, he tells me that these types of neurons don't downregulate mTOR. They're, they're hardly, they, they maintain a regeneration capacity in the adult state. They are special. But look at this. No evidence of long-distance regeneration from the cortex or the red nucleus. Very important for voluntary walking. Those neurons don't have the capacity to regenerate. We need something more, like P10 knockout or SOX3 knockout, right, to get those to go. So there's no evidence of regeneration from systems that control walking, but good evidence for regeneration from these very primitive brainstem neurons that control other kinds of functions, like urination. So we've looked at urination, and here's how we do it. There's two ways. One, we look at just voluntary urination. We put animals in these little activity chambers. They have free access to food and water. And they pee and they poop. They do their thing. And a computer just tells us when they pee and how much. 
And if you're a rat, <laughs> a rat, um, likes to pee, and you can see that you, you see these steps. So these are, these are naive animals in the chamber, and overnight, 16 hours, they pee twice an hour, about 32 times. All right, and these are naive. So that's at three months and six months in sham animals. If you look at all the control groups, notice that rats can develop some ability to urinate. It's not very normal, but they don't have to have their bladder massaged uh, anymore after about two to three weeks. So they get back some ability to pee. That's not like human. All right. Actually, the mouse is a somewhat better model. They never regain the ability to urinate at all. But the rat does get some, but it's very abnormal. They pee only a few times, four or five times a night, and the bladder just fills with urine right, and becomes very, very dystrophic. And I'll show you some pictures. If you look at all the control groups, not much, but if you look at this group right here in the lower right, notice at three months, there is some improvement. That's three months after grafting. Six full months, now we start to see really nice improvement. A half a year. And you can look at how this is frequency, so it's big, it's, that's normal, pee a lot. That's three months, not bad in blue, but much better at six months. So frequency goes up, and volume, which should be low normally, is going down a little bit at three months, but much lower at six months. So it takes six full months for recovery. And we, we stuck it out. And so the animals are doing much better in terms of their ability to, to urinate. Now, we've looked at physiology as well as just kind of crude urination. And what we see is that normally, well, here's how we do it. The animals are in a restraining device. They're not anesthetized. And we put a catheter, we use females for this. We put a catheter right through the urethra right into the bladder, and we pump saline constantly. There are electrodes on the sphincter muscle, and the, the catheter itself is hooked to a force transducer. So as the saline goes in, that stimulates urination. And we can do physiology and look to see how normal it is all right, in animals that have recovered versus controls. What happens is you can see the little, these little so the, the saline is going in, and you can see that the pressure rises to a peak. See the peak here? That's normal. And at that peak of pressure, the detrusor is starting to squeeze. And if you're a rat, unlike a human, the sphincter pulses. They pulse urine out. Rats far more complicated in the way they urinate than, than, than us. All right? So they pulsate. And if you look at the controls, you can see how abnormal the physiology is of, bla of bladder function. So they don't, they don't pee very well. But if you look at the repaired animals, we were very surprised and very happy to see that this pulsatile behavior, typical of normal animals, comes back. That's very exciting. That means the physiology of the urinary system has improved, and there's lots of quantification of all this data down here that you don't have to worry about. So they urinate better, far better, right? Just crudely, all right? And the physiology of the way they urinate is much improved. Now, is this regeneration, or is this some kind of plasticity that's been created in the caudal spinal cord? So in order to prove that regeneration is critical, you can do two things. One, you can cut the graft. And if you cut the graft, you ask, does the return function vanish? Do you go back to a, a non-regeneration state? So that's what we've done here. So after six months now, we, do, we look at the animals before and after we transect. And notice here on the far right that after transection, this frequency, which is high, now returns back. So that's, that goes back to a typical animal with a transection. And volume, which, should be, which is lower, now increases again. All right. The physiology, here's an animal before transection, the nice pulsatile behavior. And then after transection, we wait for two weeks to pass spinal shock phase. It goes right back to this abnormal behavior. So it's clear that the animal has regained function due to regeneration. All right. So that's one test to show regeneration is functionally relevant. Another way of looking at this is by doing pharmacology. So I told you that the serotonergic and the noradrenergic systems might be very important 
in urine, controlling urination. There are other neurons in the brainstem, like Barrington's nucleus, that's also important for voluntary control of, of urination. But the question is, which of these descending systems is critical for functional recovery? So we do pharmacology. We block the serotonergic system and the tyrosine hydroxylase system with drugs and ask, does that also influence the recovery, make it worse? And that's what we've done. We use a drug called methysergide to block serotonin function, and another one, which is too long to pronounce, to block noradrenergic function. And notice that what happens is that the recovery then with methysergide, here, notice that frequency goes down, see it's high and then goes down, so we know that serotonin is involved with frequency, but volume doesn't change much. If we block tyrosine hydroxylase, these noradrenergic fibers, notice there's a big drop in frequency and volume ch changes, you see? Also the behavior changes. That means those two systems that we know regenerate, the adrenergic system and serotonergic system are critical, but th these changes don't get, go back down completely to baseline, right? They don't go completely back, so that means there are other neurons that are probably also important. So by retransecting the graft and pharmacology, we believe we've proven without a shadow of a doubt that regeneration is critical for the return of function. And it's long distance regeneration. I'll show you bladder morphology as well. This is a typical bladder. And you see that the lining is very, very thin. It's called the urothelium, right? But in animals that have a spinal cord injury, because the bladder gets so huge, because it fills with so much urine, it gets very thick. But in the FGF animals, and particularly in the triple combination animals, the, the pathology in the bladder is restored back nearly to normal. And there's bladder weight measurements. See, the blue bar is much more like normal. So the bladder is better. So everything about urination is improved in these animals. Well, that's acute, that's acute injury. And that's where we started. And we thought, we thought, all right, if it works in acute stages, maybe we can apply this to the chronic injury. Now, that's taken us one year. And here's the data. So this is all brand new. What we've done, and you, this is all credit to you, Shane, is to we chronically, I don't know if it's out of focus, but it's, anyhow, what we do is to contuse the spinal cord with an infinite horizon device as hard as we can. So this is not a complete transection, it's a contusion lesion, because it's more like that of the human condition. And then we decided to bridge the lesion exactly the same way we did before with our triple combination, FGF, chondroitinase. And we went from lesioning, a period of two months passes, then we graft. It's very difficult surgically to get rid of all the scar. And we went from here to here, all right? So we just, we lesioned, we grafted, just like we did before, and we waited, all right? And hoping that we'd see changes in bladder function or anything. And there was nothing. As a matter of fact, the animals got far worse. It was pretty depressing. But don't forget, in the chronic injury state, we've got axons trapped on stem cells. So we, after six months of failure, we had a long discussion. And we thought, all right, let's change our strategy and add this intermediate phase. And we call it the wound preparation phase. So the idea is we've got to wake up these dystrophic axons before we graft. We've got to get them growing again. We've got to get them in a growth mode so they can grow on the bridge. So we have added a second step, and that is the wound preparation phase. And what we've done is to open up the animal after two months and now fill the cavity with fibrin that has FGF in it and chondroitinase. We have injected both sides with chondroitinase, and now we wait a week. So we prepare the wound, right? And now we graft after a week, goes back into the animal and grafts. And now we have results. And if you look at bladder function, in a, here's an animal at eight weeks just before grafting, and there's the number of urinations per night. It's, it's, much lower than normal. And over time, if you do nothing in the controls, they get worse, because the bladder pathology, right, is getting worse. The bladder is not working well, so they actually get worse. But in the repaired animals, 
the frequency of urination is double that of the, of, of the control. And we're really excited about that. So that means something is happening. And I just got to see the anatomy before I came. And this animal right here, I don't know if you can see it, but this is actually the, this is the these are the little graphs in the contusive cavity right here. And we've looked at now the axons that we think are important for urination, especially serotonergic and noradrenergic. There are thousands of axons in the graft, and many are, are exiting. Now, we don't know what distance they're growing, but it's clear that at least at two months, with this new strategy, right, we can get regeneration and some restra restoration of function. So now that we've got a strategy, we can add stuff, all right? And I hope lots of people join us and get excited about this to help us because we can go for much longer time periods. We don't have to wait two months. We could go a year and try it there. We have to remove the scar surgically. It has to be removed, and we pick it away. There may be other ways to get rid of scar uh, that, that remove it more gently or more completely. We can do anything that we can think of, any creative right, attempt right, to alter the wound, Lots to do here. We can add our peptide, which is coming. We can alter P10 or the SOX3 genes, right, to see if we can get other axons to grow. We can use lentichase, as possible, to give longer-term chondroitinase activity. We can add neurotrophins. GGNF is a possibility. Salmon fibrin, instead of the fibrin that we use, is a possibility. Anything we can think of, try to get these axons to grow, and then bridge. So we're really excited that now we have a strategy that it's beginning to start to work at the chronic state. So now I want to end uh, with Cajal. He said, once development is complete, the sources of growth and regeneration of axons and dendrites are irretrievably lost. In the adult brain, the nerve paths are fixed, immutable, everything can die. Nothing can be regenerated. And I hope I have convinced you, Silver, Work to Walk, 2012, after complete cord transection, even at chronic stages, Long distance regeneration with clinically relevant functional recovery is possible. And I think that's really great news. Thank you very much.